Our scripture passage this morning is from the Gospel of Mark. It's uh, chapter 13, the end of chapter 13. I'm going to begin in verse 28. Jesus said this to the disciples, Take a lesson from the fig tree. From the moment you notice its buds form, the merest tint of green, you know summer's just around the corner. And so it is with you. When you see all these things, you know he is at the door. Don't take this lightly. I'm not just saying this for some future generation, but for this one, too, these things will happen. Sky and earth will wear out, but my words won't wear out. But the exact day and hour, no one knows that. Not even the heaven's angels, not even the the son, only the father. So keep a sharp lookout, for you don't know the timetable. It's like a man who takes a trip, leaving home and putting his servants in charge, each assigned a task, and commanding the gatekeeper to stand watch. So stay at your post, watching. You have no idea when the homeowner is returning, whether evening, midnight, cock crow, or morning. You don't want him showing up unannounced with you asleep on the job. I say it to you, and I'm saying it to all. Stay at your post. Keep watch. This is a word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You can have a seat. I have become the kind of person who likes to go to bed early. (laughs) And it's a real shame because my children are teenagers and young adults, and they are not the kind of people who like to go to bed early. They seem to wake up when the sun goes down. I've noticed that often the most important thing they will say to me all day is in these last hours when I can barely keep my eyes open. In all four of the Gospels, Jesus has parting words, words of farewell for the disciples and for the reader And some say that these are the most important things that Jesus has to say. In Matthew, it's at the very end of the gospel where the resurrected Christ says to the disciples, go and make disciples of all nations. In John, these words begin in chapter 14 and they go on for a few chapters where Jesus tells his disciples to be united in love. And in Mark... Jesus' farewell discourse is found in the 13th chapter. And the basic message is exactly the two words that he ends with, keep watch. Keep watch. Stay alert. It's informative to me and I think helpful to compare Jesus' parting words in Mark with his farewell discourse in John because both are very long monologues. In each, Jesus has this private audience with his disciples, but you and I are to overhear his words. John's Jesus can lull me to sleep with comforting thoughts of love and unity and provision. But Mark's Jesus, Mark's Jesus startles me with phrases like, the desolating sacrilege, and brother will betray brother, and about that hour no one knows. If read in isolation and without much thought, these words become the words of a, you better watch your back, Jesus. You better get things right, including the power to stay alert, because there will be a time, and I can't tell you when, it's a secret, But one day I'll be taking names and you know what else. And if you're not right, you will be definitively and eternally wrong. Okay, that's not Jesus. That's not the Jesus of the Gospels. It's a common expectation of the Messiah among the people of Jesus' day and still today among some Christians But that expectation of the Messiah is misinformed, and it certainly is not good news. In Mark chapter 13, Jesus and his disciples, they've just exited the temple, and and they sit across the way with the magnificent structure in their view. 
And Jesus instructs the disciples that his death, his arrest and his death are coming. They're imminent. The passion narrative in Mark's gospel begins in just the next chapter, in chapter 14. And so Jesus says, stay awake, keep watch, he instructs them. What is next, what is about to happen will be important to witness. It will be important to take in. You know, some theologians say, and I can't disagree, that the passion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus are the most important pieces of the good news. But as my New Testament professor, Luke Johnson, wrote, those who are told to watch very shortly will prove incapable of doing so. They don't stay awake. The disciples don't stay alert. They don't take it all in. Many categorize Mark chapter 13 as apocalyptic literature writing about the end times, and I think it is a well-founded classification. This chapter in the Bible speaks of the end of the world through cosmic upheaval. This chapter of the Bible uses dualistic language like, all men will hate you because of me, and the sun will become dark. And Mark chapter 13 also speaks of the coming of the Son of Man. And this is a reference to the Old Testament book, Daniel. Uh, This passage in Mark, this chapter in Mark, actually quotes Daniel three different times. And Daniel is classic Hebrew Bible apocalyptic literature. But I want to suggest to you this morning that just as Jesus redefines the Messiah, this farewell speech reimagines the end of times. It does this by mixing together, by melding together destruction with comfort and death with life. You know, this is simply who Jesus is. Doesn't it make sense that the resurrection Messiah who tells of the darkening of the sun and the moon would immediately advise, take a lesson from the fig tree. From the moment you notice its buds form, the merest tint of green, you know that summer is just around the corner, and so it is with you. And so it is with you. When the world around you looks like death and darkness, look for that first bud. Something new is on its way. Something good is coming. Upheaval and destruction and despair, they don't mean the end. Instead, in the end, there is always, always a new beginning. So stick around, Jesus says. Keep watch. Stay alert. You know, I wondered this week, how is it that I can preach and you can listen to Advent sermons every year? If the Advent sermons are solely based, if they are are just based on the arrival of Christ, if they are solely based on the arrival of Christ 2,000 years ago and his unexpected return at an unknown distant time, how is it that you can listen and I can preach these same sermons every year. I mean, it's admirable. It's admirable and commendable that we would do that, but it's slightly boring, (laughs) and it's a little irrelevant for how I live my life this day and this week. However, if Advent is celebrated every year because I trust that I will experience a number of Christ's appearances during my lifetime, if I trust that I will see the arrival of the Son of Man many times, many times the darkening of the sun, and many times the budding of new life, then Advent makes sense, right? Then Advent makes sense, and it becomes an important reminder to me to stay alert, 
to stay awake. Pete Scazzaro is a pastor in New York. And this week I heard him endorse a book that I remember Pastor David McNitsky always liked. The name of the book is The Patient Ferment of the Early Church by a historian, a scholar named Alan Kreider. Um, It was written in 2016, and it's on my reading list. In this book, Kreider asks the question, how is it that the early church grew at the very beginning, in the first 400 years, in spite of harassment and in spite of occasional very intense persecution from the Roman Empire? Kreider's answer is patience. Patience, he says, a comprehensive culture of patience, along with very careful, intentional discipleship for each individual. Always watching, always staying alert. You see, Kreider claims that the outsiders in the first 400 years of Christianity were attracted to the faith because of the non-anxious, unforced lifestyle of the Christians. And I think that makes some sense. Now, patience does not mean doing nothing, and it doesn't mean freezing up, and it doesn't mean hiding out. Far from that, I believe, patience among the faithful. There's a story of a medieval rabbi who was asked the question, If you're heading out to plant a tree and you learn that the Messiah is coming later that day, what do you do? And the rabbi's answer was, you plant the tree. You plant the tree. This work of intentional discipleship, it's always in front of us. It's always in front of us, whether we are in a time of distress or a time of joy. Maybe especially when we are in times of distress. Tertullian was one of the earliest church theologians. He lived in the third century in North Africa, and we have some of the things that he wrote. He wrote a treatise on the importance of patience, and in this treatise, he wrote these words, when the Spirit of God descends, patience is an inseparable companion. God's nature, he said, is to be patient. And the most visible sign of this patience is Jesus, the incarnation. When the Spirit of God descends, patience is an inseparable companion. You know, I'm reminded of two people who were present at the temple when the infant Jesus was presented, Anna and Simeon. Simeon, the scripture tells us, was a good man who lived in prayerful expectancy of help for Israel. And Anna was an elderly widow, a prophet, always present in the temple, fasting and praying. In Luke chapter 2, we find the story of two wise elders who did the work of faith, and patience was their inseparable companion. They did, in fact, see the Christ child. They saw God. They witnessed the first bud of spring. And so you and I wait. We wait also. We stay alert. We keep watch. Would you pray with me? Come, thou long-expected Jesus. We wait for new hope this day. In the places where our world is dark and distressed, we are yearning for your visible presence. We are fearful. We are at times tired. And we are even hopeless. Would you grant us persistence and grant us patience? that we may one day share in your joy. We wait and we hope. Amen.